Turn to your neighbor and say, you asked for it. That's where we're going tonight. A few weeks ago, we took some time and we threw a phone number up on the screen that you could text some questions to. What do you wish that we talked about in the church? What are some things that you struggle with? Some things that you've been through that you're like, man, we don't talk about blank, right? Or what are just some topics or some legitimate questions that you have? Tonight, we're going to do part one of this series. Here's the question that we're going to touch on tonight. Somebody sent in, why does God take things away from us when we need them the most? I want to expand that um, and include why do bad things happen to good people? Turn to your neighbor and say, you asked for it. Oh, I'm so excited about this. If you have your Bible, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Turn to your neighbor, say Matthew. Turn to your other neighbor, say chapter 8. If you haven't caught on yet, I'm a talkative guy, and I like to encourage you to also be talkative. So I hope you like who you sat next to. All right, Matthew 8, we're going to start in verse 23. It says, Then he, who is Jesus, then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed. Suddenly a furious storm, everybody say storm. storm. A furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. Tonight, I want to title part one of our sermon series, Sailboat. Turn to your neighbor and say, sailboat. No, like me, like the southern accent, say, sailboat. Let's pray together. God, thank you for these people in the room. Thank you for an awesome opportunity to be together tonight. God, I thank you for your presence that has been so tangible already. I thank you that you have a word for tonight, so I ask that you will speak through me. I ask that you will give hearts and minds to hear exactly what you want us to hear, that the word would do the work tonight, that we would leave here different than we came in and with five extra friends in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, freshman year philosophy class. How many of you have taken a philosophy class? Okay, you're going to understand. Those of you that haven't, maybe pray about it. Is it might be bad? (laughs) Might be good. Might be bad. It's an interesting experience. The idea of philosophy is literally like, well, let's question everything. That's basically the idea of philosophy, which, let me be honest with you, that's really healthy. Because a lot of people in the Christian world grew up in church and have no idea what they believe. Right, and then you turn like 19, 20, 21, and all your friends have all these combative things to say. And you're like, I don't know, (laughs) right? Like it can hit so heavy because you haven't learned. So there's an aspect of theology, philosophy that is really healthy, right? To actually understand what we believe. Well, my freshman year, your boy was at Pellissippi State Community College. (laughs) Holla at you, boy. I was there at Pellissippi, and I thought it would be a great idea to take a philosophy class. It's in one of those like portable buildings out on the backside, and I knew it was going to be interesting from the first week. We walked in on the first week, and this guy started making jokes about Christianity, and I was like, oh, no. By the second week, he had openly admitted he was atheist, and I was like, well, you're, you're not supposed to be biased, right? You're a philosophy professor, but whatever. I digress. We start the class. Very early on, this professor comes out on a week and he goes, okay, today I want to talk about the God of the Israelites. And I'm like, I got you. We can talk about this. And he says, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm like, yep, we're on the same page now. Like, I'm with you, right? We're good. And he says, let's talk about that for a minute. Most Christians would would say that this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be all powerful in order to be God. And we're all like, yeah, yeah. Makes sense, right? We're all in agreement. All powerful, right? He would be all knowing because he's God. You're like, yeah, okay, we're all on the same page. That makes sense. When he continues, he says, well, we actually also believe that God is love. So he's all loving. And we're like, yeah. So he's like, okay, all powerful, all knowing, all loving. And the whole class is like, yes, we're following with you. Okay, then we're good. Well, then he, he says, logically, then, if God is all knowing, God knows when bad things will happen. If God is all-loving, he cares about the people around him. And if God is all-powerful, he stops all bad things from happening. And at this point, I was like, 
why you got to go. Because I'm like, I don't have three days to argue with you about this. And I'm 19 at the time, right? Like, I, I'm still trying to figure things out. I didn't have years of ministry leadership under my belt the same way that I do now. But if we're being real, that's a legitimate thing. Can we be like, how many in the room, you're like, yeah, I've wondered the same thing because this is weird, right? Okay, I want to deal with some of that tonight because this is a real situation. We live in a world that's broken. We live in a world that's hurting, and it can be so confusing because there's, there's times, listen, God is not a man that he should lie. There are no contradictions in this word, but there is balance in this word. And there are times that we, we get caught on like a prosperity gospel that now I'm a Christian and I'm going to be rich because of it, right? We get in all these different things. Or we go on the other side that's like, well, I'm going to be a martyr now. But there's a balance somewhere in between where God can reveal himself and we can get to some of the answers. Turn to your neighbor say, you asked for it. I want to start with one massively important acknowledgement. And that is that God never said that following him would be easy. You will not find a place in scripture that says, if you become a Christian, it's going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy from there on out. It's not going to happen. You won't find that. You'll find passages on either side, but you won't find that simplicity. The context for our story tonight is Jesus is doing his ministry. So Matthew chapter 8, right? Go back there if you're not there still. Matthew chapter 8, he is doing his ministry. This is when Jesus is like officially here. He's teaching He's healing. He's gathering the disciples around him. And the Bible says that he's in this town and he heals this man. And because of that, it draws a lot of attention. So much attention that one of the religious leaders comes around and is real intrigued. So much so that he wants to follow Jesus. Check this out in verse 18. It says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I follow you wherever you go. But check out Jesus' response. He replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And I just feel like if I'm one of the disciples, I'm like, huh? <laughs> what? There's a lot of times in the New Testament where that's how these conversations go down. This guy says to Jesus, I believe in you. I want to follow you. And Jesus says, foxes have dens. <laughs> and I'd have been like, facts. you right. <laughs> you know. And the disciples are looking at each other like, that man tells the truth. That's, that's real, right? But what Jesus has said to him is, hey, wait a minute. Listen, you got to know in advance, I do things differently. So he says, I'm sold out. I'm coming with you. And Jesus goes, that's fine, but I don't have a home. Because now I travel all the time. I do ministry all the time. What's important to me is different than what you might think is important to me. And then the disciples see it firsthand because it's the next verse that we read at the beginning. Where Jesus says, hey, take me out onto the lake. And they go across. And what happens? They go straight into a storm. He said, hey, if you're going to follow me, this may not look the way you expect it to. Because foxes have dens. But the Son of Man doesn't have a home. He does whatever the Father would have him do, and he runs with it. So if you're going to follow me, you better be aware ahead of time, it's not always simple. Turn to your neighbor and say, it ain't simple. So then what happens? The disciples get in the boat, they roll out onto the lake, and a massive storm hits. For my note takers in the room, note number one, it will storm. Storms will come. You realize Jesus himself is with them on the boat. He led them onto the lake, and then the storm hits. It will storm. Now, here's the complicated part. Sometimes God intervenes, and sometimes he doesn't. That's where everybody on the planet is just left to be human and to not fully understand God's ways. How many of you are like, did pastor just say he doesn't know? Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. Can I be really honest? It is, it is wild to watch. Because I, I get to serve in just the most incredible church. And, and I get to be a part of people's lives. And I have been 
in the hospital room with people that have been told they're about to die and we pray together and then they don't. And it's like, oh my gosh, God intervened in the middle of a storm, right? And this just changed. Equally, I've been in the hospital room when somebody's father just passed away and gone, okay, the storm came and went. What just happened? There are times when God intentionally intervenes and there are some times when he doesn't. But hear me clearly, that is not the same thing as God causing something bad to happen. There are times that God will intervene and prevent something, and there's times that he doesn't, but that doesn't mean that he caused it to happen. If you were to take a theology class, they're going to talk about something called the Adamic sin. And what that is, is it's the OG sin. It's where Adam and Eve sin and eat the fruit from the forbidden tree. So all the way back in Genesis, God creates this wonderful earth and he creates Adam and he says it's not good for man to be alone. So he creates Eve and it's the two of them and all the animals and they're just living the dream. It's out in the sunshine and they're tan and it's wonderful, right? And they get to name all the animals and they're building their farm and everything is great and they have one rule, don't eat the fruit from that over there, right? That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that. That's the only rule. Here's why that's important. At that point in history, there was no other issue. And when I say no other issue, I mean they didn't have a cold. There was no cancer. There was no lying. There were no hurricanes, tornadoes. There was no other issue. The way that God had created this was, hey, in order for us to really do covenant together, free will has to be a thing. But I don't want you to be created into this world to have to deal with full knowledge of all the sin and evil and junk that's out there. So just don't eat from that tree. Well, and then they eat from the tree. Spoiler alert, in case you didn't know. They ate from the tree. That is known as the Adamic sin. What that caused is a, bra a broken system. And from that point on, sin entered the world. They became aware that they were naked. They became aware of the, the sin that they had just committed. And from that point on, natural disasters happened. People died at a way younger age. Lying, cheating, affairs, gambling, drunkardness. All of this happened out of nowhere. Why? Because of the original sin. The reason that that's important is there are a lot of times that we get frustrated with God for something that somebody else did. Or, or somebody's born into a really awful situation and they're frustrated with God. When he, he may have not had anything to do with it. Because again, he doesn't always prevent things from happening. And we're born into this craziness. So let me speak on another topic for a minute. Our culture right now is really intentional with I was born this way, right? I, I, I didn't choose this. I didn't whatever. I, I was born to feel this way. I was born with this tendency. And you may have not heard pastors say this much before, but I don't really struggle with that terminology because nobody had to teach me to be tempted to look at porn. That's a fleshly tendency because I was born into brokenness. You're born into a sinful world. That's the reason Jesus says in order to follow me, you've got to be born again. That's the whole point. We're born into a place. There, there are places in Scripture where um, there's another place in the Gospels where there's this man that's born blind. And the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned? Did he sin or did his parents sin that he's sick like this? And Jesus said, neither. He was born into this so that my glory could be shown. We live in a broken world where sometimes stuff just happens. Sometimes things just don't go the way we want them to. Sometimes people make really bad decisions and it messes everything up for a while. Sin can break things. I had a meeting today and I was talking to somebody about it. I'm like, man, sin is awful. <laughs> we read the Bible and there's times that we're like, why does the Bible say that this is sin? It shouldn't be a problem, whatever. No, sin can break people's lives apart. It can destroy marriages. It can destroy homes. It can cause this crazy depression, oppression, anxiety. Sin is the problem. But Jesus. So to finish the gospel story, Jesus shows up and died on a cross for our sin. That's the gospel. So that we would not be a slave to sin anymore, but that we would be a child of God. 
And it, 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 we talk about it sometimes, like in the church, we, those are like churchy terms, right? I'm not a slave to sin anymore, I'm a child of God. But that's because it is the most powerful statement. If you can get a hold of that, it will mess your life up in the best way. When you accept Jesus, legitimate life transformation can happen. Man, why do bad things happen? Because we're born into a broken world. And storms will come because of it. Good things can happen to bad people, and bad things can happen to good people. And then we start getting into this question. So let me, let me start with the initial question, which was, why does God take things when I need it most? Why does God take people when I need them the most? First, I would ask, did God take them? Because people have free will. Sometimes they make bad decisions. God didn't cause that to happen. Accidents happen. Disasters happen. And I don't understand why God intervenes in some situations and doesn't in others, but that doesn't mean that it was God's fault that something transitioned and that something changed. Jesus never promised that everything would be easy or that he would prevent every sad thing from happening. But, oh, praise God, <laughs> there's a but, right? Because I can feel it in the room. Everybody's like, oh, geez. That's right, he didn't say that things would be simple. <laughs> I'm going to be a martyr, right? No, chill. Okay, well, well. <laughs> the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus tells the disciples, this is after Jesus has died on a cross. He is risen from the grave and he comes back to the disciples. And his last words to them are, go into all the earth and make disciples. And I will be with you to the end of the earth. I will be with you to the end of the earth. Storms happen, but Jesus is in the boat. And he was asleep for part of it. To show them that even if the noise is going on around you, I'm still here. He's not such a deep sleeper that he couldn't tell they were in a storm. Spoiler alert. <laughs> he was still there. Now here's where the balance comes in. A lot, of the, a lot of your walk with Christ will be about balance. You learn that. I say that like I'm an old man, right? 60, stuck in a 27-year-old's body. But it's all about balance. As I said earlier, there's nothing in this Bible that will contradict itself. But here's what I mean by balance. 23rd Psalm. If you walk through Hobby Lobby, you will see it hanging everywhere. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? You're there with me. Half of you can, can go with it. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. He guides my footsteps for His namesake. He will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Doesn't that sound incredible? Because you read that passage and you're like, bro, I can do anything. I'm eating dinner with the Lord as he is fighting my battles. I'm going to lay out in the field by the stream and just relax in the sunshine. I've got it all figured out and it's totally fine, right? Well, then you jump to the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus himself says, unless you die to yourself, you can't follow me. Those two things aren't contrasting, though. They go hand in hand. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. If anyone wants to find their life, they must lose it. Well, wait a minute. I like the 23rd Psalm I like a lot better than that. Then this one, I'm laying in the field in the sunshine, and I hear the trickling water in the background, right? And the Lord's bringing me food while he's fighting my enemy. That feels great, right? That whole pick up my cross thing doesn't feel so good. But they go hand in hand. They go together. Man, the early Christians were killed for their faith. And there's this balance somewhere in between, and we watch people all the time go extremes on either side, where they're like, the Lord, He wants me to be poor. He wants me to give away everything I've ever had. It is the Lord's will for my life to be really sad every day. And they may not literally say that, but I promise you there are people that feel that way. Equally, there are people that will say, no, I'm a Christian, so I should be rich. I should have everything I could ever need. One problem, storms will come. Storms will still show up. 
And we've got to figure out how to find the balance, how to read the Word of God, take it for all that it is, and go, okay, clearly storms can happen. God is the author of good things, not bad things. Yeah, these are biblical truths. So He doesn't cause the drama. He doesn't cause the heartache and the sin and the mess to happen. And like I said, I, I don't know. I don't know why sometimes He intervenes and sometimes He doesn't. But let's use our, our deduction a little bit better than that philosophy professor did, right? <laughs> so, let me move to the second part then. If we've got... That first question out of the way, did God take this from me? Did God cause this, right? Okay, well, let's assume for a moment that God did. Let's assume for a moment that there was something, more than likely someone, that was taken, quote-unquote, from your life. Either because there was a death or there was a, a struggle or there was some drama or whatever. You lost a friend, you lost a significant other, you lost a family member because of whatever had been going on. Let's assume for a minute that somehow you had definitive proof that God did it. Okay, deductive reasoning. If we believe what's in this word, then we believe that Jesus is the Lord of all. Amen? If we believe what's in this word, then we believe that God is our Heavenly Father. In the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verse 7, he says, So you are no longer a slave, a slave to sin, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So, Jesus is Lord over all, God is a heavenly father, and I am his kid. All three of those things matter so much. Because that means the chances are good that if he did take something or someone, it was because he knew that business was bad for you. Proverbs chapter 3 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. I continuously got in trouble when I was little for running off. It was my thing. I don't know why. It was my thing. When I was real little, I was playing in the backyard and my mom turned around for two seconds and I jumped the creek and took off running. I knew I was not supposed to cross the creek. That was like the, the line. We just didn't do that. I jumped across the creek and I took off running up the hill. I kid you not, a couple hours later, at least it felt like hours later, realistically it was probably like 15 minutes, okay? For the sake of story, it was two hours. Two hours later, I found myself at like seven years old, four streets over, in our neighborhood at somebody's fence. And I remember, I have very few memories from being that young, but I remember this like it was yesterday. I was standing at the fence at like seven years old, holding my, my fingers around this little silver fence, just looking at this happy family. Like, oh, I used to have one of those. <laughs> right? Like, I remember when I had a dad. Right? I was like, so melodramatic. And this sweet family, this, this mom walked over and was like, child, she picked me up over the fence and they're like, whose kid are you, right? Like, where do you belong? And I was like, over there. And I kid you not, I told them, well, we had this castle in the driveway. Can you drive me until we find the castle? And they just put me in their minivan. I'm just sitting in the passenger seat on a stroll. Until literally we pull up in front of the house and I could see the castle there in the driveway. And I was like, oh my God, that's my castle. The lady opens the van and it, it is movie worthy, right? Eight-year-old me is just running slow motion. My mom picks me up, hugs me. It's the sweetest moment. That happened more than once. It happened at the mall. When I was a teenager, I ran away just because I was angry and I wanted to give it to my parents. I kid you not, my brother and I were fighting over who had the time to play the PlayStation. It was my turn. I was probably 13 years old, y'all. Your pastor has had some issues, and I am the pastor. It's not getting any better. I was 13 years old. I was angry that my parents would not let me play the PlayStation 2. We had a sweet game. It was Medal of Honor Frontline. Any of you OGs, you know what I'm talking about? It was my turn to play, and my brother was hogging it, and my parents fussed at me and told me to go to my room because I was fussing at them, and I was so angry I had had enough. So you know what I did? I schemed. I was in my bedroom, and I was like, I can get straight to the front door. They won't even know what happened. I can. I literally, I mapped the whole thing out, I kid you not. I don't know why I'm being so detailed about this story. Just be blessed. 
I cleared the last eight steps to get to the foyer, swung the door wide, cleared the steps off the front porch, hung a left around the fence, took off over the street into the woods that was behind my buddy's house. And I got over there and was so proud. I'm not even going to lie. I was like, yeah, my parents are going to be scary. They're going to be wondering where I am. And in a little while, I'll come home and they'll appreciate me better. And then it'll be my time to play PlayStation. And then I got mad. You know why? I had a cell phone. I was 13. And I was so mad at my parents because they didn't call me. But they called my neighbor and my cousin to tell them I had run away. Did they know where I had gone? So then I was even more embarrassed because, like, Alex didn't need to know. <laughs> Tyler never needed to know, right? It was, no, it was no problem. But I came back. The Ramsey kids were famous for things like this. My siblings, they didn't run away. They just tried to drown themselves. Both of them at least once jumped into the pool without water wings. <laughs> Where are my water wing people at? Like, you know exactly what I'm saying by water wings. Yeah, yeah. Floaties, you know what I'm saying? You put them up in your arm and they chafe your armpits. They're the worst thing ever. We would roll this. It was hilarious. We were just so excited to get there and swim that we would get out of the car and we would see the pool. And that was it. Straight to the deep end. On more than one occasion, the oldest brother saved the day. Like they wouldn't have been, anybody around would have jumped in and got him. It would have totally been fine. But because of that, you know what my parents did? They made some rules. Mom was like, when I get out of this van, you are standing right next to me. Until we get up there. And when we get up there, you are putting sunscreen on and water wings. And then and only then can you get in the pool. There were rules. Why? Because my mom didn't want the seven-year-old wandering off to the neighbors again. My mom didn't want one of us literally to drown. So there's simple rules that my mom put in place. If God has taken someone from your life, it's because he's your father. And he knows better. And you have no idea how toxic or how influential that person or that thing could be for your future. We talked about it a little bit in past weeks where we did the relationship series. And I told you about all the craziness that was my dating life. Huh, praise God he took some things away. And now I look back and I'm like, oh, that was bad. That wouldn't have worked. I was an idiot. Like those are the things that go back through my head now that it, hindsight is 2020, right? You go back and you look back and you're like, man... At the time, I cried many tears. And I remember praying, God, I thought you said this was okay. I was so invested in this relationship. I was so invested in these friendships where friends moved away and all these things happened. And I thought for sure that was long-term people. That was going to be my ride or die until the end, and then they weren't. And in the moment, I'm going, oh my gosh, what is happening? Because I'm in a storm. But my father knew that if those people and if those things had stayed in my life, there is no way I would be a pastor right now. There is no way I would be where I am right now. There's no way I would have the incredible marriage that I have. There's no way I would be in the position that I'm in and just in life in general if he had not taken those things away from me. Change happens and, and storms happen. And now I look back and it's like, well, some of it was just natural transition of life. And some of it was God intentionally removing things. And you know, I deserved it because I didn't realize it, but I was praying that. I was praying those reckless prayers like, God, I just want your will for my life. Right? That's like asking God for patience. <laughs> Lord, I just want to be patient. And then you get cut off 11 times on the interstate. <laughs> right? God, I want patience. And you're like turning up the metal music, just hoping that that helps it feel better. Just me? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. I was praying things like, God, I want your will for my life. I, I want to be where you want me to be, so God, I just give you lordship over my life. And then you know what he did? He said, oh, okay, well, this is bad for you. Let's get that out of there. And then I'm like, whoa, 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 that's not, that's not what I meant. That's not what I intended. But if I'm his child, 
and he's my father and he's a heavenly father, he knows better. Amen? You see, change happens and is inevitable. There are things that are going to come and things that are going to go and it is just part of life. And there are some times where you can tangibly look back and you can go, yeah, that was probably God saving me from something. And there's times where you can look back and you go, man, yeah, that one person made that decision and that really caused some pain or this sin happened or, or there was this accident that happened or there was this whatever that you can go back and you can understand a little better. But in the moment, in the storm, it does not feel good. How many of you feel like you've been in a storm? Real talk? When I was a freshman in high school... We used to go to the cove and uh, take boats out there. I learned to wakeboard with the youth group. I was awful at it. I'm thankful there's not footage. But I yeah, probably, there probably is somewhere. But I was a freshman in high school, and we went out one day, and we had waited forever for our turn to get on the boat because your boy was trying to learn to wakeboard. We get out there. They pull us out on the boat. We literally had just enough time to get all the way to the other side of the lake, and this massive storm came through. And our leaders were just trying to rush us through so everybody would have a fair chance because, you know, at that point we had been waiting for forever. But then we're stranded on the other side in this speedboat. <laughs> not good. Speedboats don't do well in a storm. Okay, in case you didn't know, it's not great. I was freaking out. Fifteen, right? Still pretty young. Just now learning to wakeboard. Had no idea how to, how to get back there. And if you've ever been to Cove Lake, you know that there's some places that it, that joker's deep. And in a storm, that's not a great place to be. What we ended up doing, I genuinely to this day, I need to ask the guy that was driving the boat because he literally docked at somebody else's dock. Like we literally just parked the boat at a stranger's dock, tied it off, got out of the boat in pouring rain, crazy wind, and up on the top of the hill there's a restaurant. So we walked in this monsoon up to the restaurant, and then we're all just stressed because we had left our phones back in the church van on the opposite end of the lake. So I'm like crying to the kitchen people, <laughs> like the waitress is coming by. I'm like, I just want to go home, right? I wasn't that dramatic at 15. But I wanted to go home and the storm has hit and all of this stuff has happened. Y'all judging me. <laughs> I, probably, I probably really was that dramatic at 15, but let's be accurate. I've shared too many stories. Y'all know me too well. I probably was that dramatic. But it is storming so strong outside, and we have absolutely no idea how to get back to where we're going. If you, have you ever been in a boat in a storm and know a cruise does not count? Yes. Yeah? It's crazy. Yeah. Like, it's a different ball game. If you've ever been just out on the lake where it's crazy busy, you can feel the wake, and you're sitting in this little boat, and even just the wake will make you nauseous because it's moving so much. This boat that Jesus and the disciples are in when this storm hits, it ain't a cruise ship. They're out on a lake, and it would have been a sailboat. <laughs> they didn't have propellers back then. So they had these oars to get them out into the water, and then they popped the sails out, and they just used that, right? Well, here's the problem. When the wind's blowing crazy in a storm, you have no idea where you're going to end up. Jesus is fast asleep, and what had to have been a small cubby down in the bottom level of this boat, and this sailboat is just getting thrown all over the place. There are times in life where that is exactly how it feels. God changes happening all over the place. I feel like a sailboat getting thrown around in the wind and in the storm and in the stuff. People have come out of my life. I feel like God has taken things from me or I have made mistakes that have taken things from me. People have hurt me. Junk has gone down. Drama has happened. Either way, I'm on a little sailboat out on the lake in a storm. One of my favorite songwriters, Ben Rector, he literally wrote a song called Sailboat. Dude says, I'm out on the waves and I'm hoping and praying, please let this wind blow me home. Night after night, there's an empty horizon. My God, do I feel so alone. Most of the time, I feel like a sailboat. I was listening to that this week and was like, shoo. Sometimes, that's exactly how it feels. But you know what the beauty of this is? Jesus wakes up in the boat and says, stop. And it stops. He didn't promise that there wouldn't be storms. But he is so faithful every single time to be in the boat. 
And when he's in the boat, you can rest assured that he is still your good shepherd, that he provides for every need, that he can get you through whatever's about to happen. Being a Christian does not mean that everything is just going to always make sense, that you're going to have all the answers, and that you're just going to be rich all the time. Right? That, that is not how this thing works. What it means is you're always going to have somebody with you. Jesus is asleep, but he's making them abundantly aware that even if it feels like he's not moving, he's still present. So hear me. It rains on the just and on the unjust, but we have an umbrella. Sometimes bad stuff just happens because bad stuff happens. I don't know, that sounds like such a lame excuse. And for me to say, well, sin is in the world may just make you roll your eyes, but that's the truth. And one day it won't be. One day we go back to heaven with Him and everything's different. And there's no more hurt. There's no more addictions. There's no more shame. There's no more condemnation. There's no more division. There's no more anxiety, fear, depression. There's no more cancer. There's no more accidents. There's no more world situation. There's just Him and the unity that He designed this thing to be. But for now, you have the best umbrella on the planet. Hebrews chapter 6 is one of my favorite passages of scripture. 619 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. To just keep rolling with the sailboat vibe, even in a storm, you are anchored. We have an anchor. Eyes closed and Heads bowed across the room. Sometimes things just happen and um, it's not even God's fault. And, and sometimes God will intentionally do things to keep you where he wants you to be. To protect you, to protect somebody else. He never promised that bad things wouldn't happen, but oh, he is so faithful to be with you through every step and every moment. My God is faithful to provide every need and He is good and He takes care of His kids. That doesn't mean that it won't storm sometimes, but if you don't hear anything else tonight, hear this. Even in the midst of the storm, Jesus is with you. Tonight as we take a couple minutes and we worship some more, you may have to remind yourself Man, this doesn't feel good. I don't like what things look like right now, but he is the king of my heart. He is Lord over my life, and he will never let me down. So even if the storm is going all around me, Jesus, you are Lord, and you are good. For the one in the room that feels like they are in the middle of a storm, it feels so real. I'm in a small sailboat, Pastor. I feel like I've toppled at this point. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what this is supposed to look like. You are not too far gone. And he is still with you. For the one that feels like they have made the mistakes that have messed things up too far gone, he is still with you. Just turn to him. Call on Jesus' name. You don't have to literally wake Jesus up. But call on his name. Turn to him. You don't need somebody else around you. This can be between you and him right now. Holy Spirit, heal hearts tonight. Heal the loneliness. Heal the hurt from where people have left. Trauma has happened. Heal the heart tonight that is lonely, that is wounded. God, heal the heart that is caught in addiction and in sin to such a degree that they are free from the bondage and the junk. Holy Spirit, pour out your favor in this house tonight. Your word declares that the Spirit of the Lord hovers the earth, searching for those whose hearts are fully committed to Him to strengthen them. So tonight we turn to you, Lord Jesus, and we say that you are Lord over our lives. And we ask you to calm the storm and to show us how near you are, even in the middle of it. In Jesus' name.